What's up, my fellow parents? You're listening because you love your kids. You want to be the best parent you can be, and you want to stop yelling. So, hey, welcome to the club. I, too, want to stop yelling, and parenting is freaking hard. And these kids bring out the worst in us. They bring out the best in us. And so I'm going to give you some awesome, awesome coaching here for your mind, for your family, for your emotions, and what, how you talk to yourself, how you talk to your kids. Because yelling, this is a Jordan, this is a top five parenting struggle and an issue, man. It's a hot topic. It's so hard. I mean, okay, let's just sum up. The quick answer is pretend you're in a library all the time and you just have to whisper. <laughs> oh my God. That's funny. Hey, hey. Hey, stop hitting your brother and sister. Stop yeah. hitting your brother right now. Shh. That, stop that actually might work for some people. That might be like a five-star parenting tip right now. Like, yeah, what if you – yeah, because if you don't yell when you're at Costco or Target because of the social ramifications, if you just pretend right. in your mind like right. someone's watching you, that actually yeah. might be really helpful, honestly, if you think about that. Yeah, but uh, – I've been there before where I've gotten really angry at my kids and I was like speaking them – uh, you know, like not a good parenting way, not something right. I should be doing. And then someone walks by and I pretend I'm all lovey dovey at that exact same moment. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, I'm such a hypocrite. This is so silly. You're, you're on TV, big weather channel. So you, you're actually probably used to this. What I'm about to say for me, it's kind of new. Um, I, I, uh, I occasionally have people stop me on the streets and like, Oh my gosh, I love your videos or Hey Sean, or how's it going? Like stop me at Trader Joe's or whatever at the store. And so now like when I'm out in public, I'm thinking like there's somebody who might be watching me. So like, <laughs> If I, Smart. I, I have to like, you know, if I feel stressed or if I'm out in public with my kids or family, it's like an extra sense of like, it's kind of like that library thing. Like, you know, you have to use your mind to really bring out the best. Now, let me tell you about a time that I wasn't my best. So yes, I, the family coach, yes, the guy who makes this podcast, the guy who makes these videos, I still struggle with yelling sometime. It was a few weeks ago. And as you know, one of my, one of my kryptonites is that bedtime routine. I just, it's really hard for me. Another kryptonite is, you know, when I see one of the siblings bullying or threatening or being mean to another. So here I am. Imagine me a few weeks ago with my seven year old and she's not listening to me. I'm tired. I'm cranky. I'm at the end of my rope. I should have done the things that I'm going to talk about in this podcast. And instead I did this. Am I, am I going to have to yell? Am I, do, do you want me to yell right now? Mike, do I, are you? If you don't listen to me, I'm gonna yell. Okay, I'm yelling. And as you can hear, my voice is strong. Like even the neighbors probably just heard, could easily heard. And then what did I do? I mean, this sweet little seven-year-old girl just crumbles in fear and in tears. You broke. You broke your daughter. You wrecked her world, man. I'm such a bad parent. You yelled. I'm a loser. I'm a fraud. I shouldn't be making any videos. Hey, in in, in all fairness, hey, in all fairness, you gave the warning. I'll give the warning too. I'll be like, hey, I'm giving you a warning. I'm going to give you another warning. One last warning. And then boom, the bubble pops. Oh, gosh. (laughs) The the, the aggression. And I tried, man, but I failed. And I do fail sometimes at the things that I teach. But, um, But I think you have some good news. Hey, if you are struggling with yelling, screaming, losing your temper, this episode is for you. And we have some really good news for you. We're not I mean, going to, this episode, Jordan, is not about mom guilt, dad guilt. We're going to go through a lot in the next, in this time together. But Jordan, you've got some yummy news for us. Well, I mean, and spouse, like this is just a good topic in general. Are you a CEO of a company? Like yelling does not work. You know, if you have been yelling with your spouse or your significant other, that does not work. What about with your kids? And so this is something that we have to constantly you know, be adapting to of like less and less yelling. Let's build, let's, let's strengthen our, our, our use of words and make sure that we're doing what we need to do to make sure whatever we're trying to get across gets across. And there is some research out there that suggests yelling can be okay. All right. And that's the reality. Everybody tell us, this is a lot of research actually. Yeah. And I mean, it's not the long-term advice. It's not the long-term advice, but it, what does it do? It makes someone stop whatever they're doing in that moment, and then you've got the, the floor, okay? Power. If, if yes, they, you've got power. So the Gottman Institute, which Sean talks about a lot, you know, says if you yell, if you're yelling at your spouse, if you're yelling at Dorian, you're not going to ruin them for their life. Your relationship isn't over. We understand that 
you know, things come up, but the ultimate goal is to get to a place where you don't have to do that. And even if like, if you guys can think about like, maybe you're in a relationship, um, you know, non-kid related, let's think about like, uh, you were in your, you know, dating world before you got married and you were trying to figure out your significant other. And there were times where you have your first fight and your second fight, you know, you, you, do you go to bed angry? Do you not? And the reality is like the Gottman Institute did this study where, they basically took people who were constantly in fights and they stopped them right in the middle of their fight and said, okay, go, go to your corner. You go to your corner, read a magazine for 30 minutes. They read a magazine and they came back and then the fighting stopped. They were able to talk things out and they were able to actually get their points across and actually move the needle. So basically it's like what you've been talking about, Sean, little timeouts could actually help in these situations. Do they tell you what magazine that they read? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right? Highlights. Right, Do you remember like, the one highlights oh, as a kid? Or you'd like <laughs> Oh, you gotta find what's wrong with the picture. They didn't read that. Yes. Magazine, that would be that would make me mad. Right? Which yeah. magazine would you read? If you could only read one magazine to calm you down, what would be your magazine? Probably not a political magazine, right? No. Like that, that, yeah, it would be like, Probably like Outdoor Living. That would be your magazine. Yeah. Outdoor, outdoor Living. living. Yeah, outdoor, relaxing. Not like a, that's not like an old lady magazine. They show like cabins and stuff and like pink. Well, I don't know. I just something about like living in the outdoors, being yeah. in the outdoors, having a cabin, showing pictures of like right. water, you know, something like that. Yeah, I like it. Ditto for that. Me too. You know what? This is really good news. Let me just echo what he said. There's a lot of research out there that if you yell sometimes, it's okay. If your spouse, your kids yell, it's okay. Yelling is not bad. You know, anger is not bad. You can get through it. You, and if it's bad for you or yelling is hard for you to receive, well, it might say more about you than it does the person who is yelling. It, it's like you want to be in these relationships with your family, your partner, your spouse, where they don't have to say everything perfectly to you in the perfect tone. That's what the research tells us. And if you feel like, you know, you have your spouse or someone in your life, it's like they have to say things perfectly to you. Otherwise, it triggers you or pushes your buttons. Well, that might be a time for you to do some work on yourself. Why are you take things on so heavily? Why do you feel like, you know, so triggered by people's words? This is like really exciting news. Now, in the next couple of minutes, we're going to we're going to now turn the tone and we're going to talk about some bad research, Jordan. So this is like a comedy. It's about to become a dark drama of a movie that we're going to go through. Are you ready? It's OK, this? we'll get to the other side. Let's get through the other side. Now, Jordan, I think it's important to talk about some of this bad research, but not too much. We actually talked about this before we hit the record. Why do you think we should not spend too much time talking about the negative research around yelling? I think it's the same thing why many of us don't like watching the news. Like there's just so much negative. It brings you anxiety. You don't see, you know, there's no hope. There's no like answer. You're just negative, 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 bad, 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 bad is not good for us. So I think what you're trying to do is you're going to give us an understanding as to why yelling isn't good, but you also have an answer as to why we can change it and why it's better on the other side. And if you didn't really honor, respect my buddy, Jordan Steele, then what he just said it may, I hope you just, it makes me love you and respect you even more. This is coming from a man in the news, right? He's in that space of the media. And here he is, a member of the media saying, you know what? The media is so negative sometimes and it hurts people. So Jordan, dude, thank you for saying that. And uh, yeah, man. Say, hear more about that. All right, here's a couple quick things on science and research. I'm just going to recap some of them. I'm going to give you some direct quotes on other them. But here's what I want you to do. If you struggle with yelling, I do not want you to turn this channel. I want you to spend the next five minutes of your life just listening, learning, grieving, and coming face to face with this area of your life that you struggle with. And Jordan, I love you. We care about you. We make this to support you, not to shame you, but we are on your team. We want to help you become the best parent you can be to put these family cycles behind you, these family patterns behind you to help you manage your emotions so they don't manage you. So Jordan, should we do that? Amen. Amen to that. Yes, all please. Right, so, all right. All right. Mantracare.com tells us from their research, quoting other more scientific pages, science tells us that when we are yelled at, okay, so you yelling at someone or you getting yelled at, our brains, I'm really bad with pronouncing something. Amygdala. Um, is triggered. And when <laughs> this happens, the body releases cortisol and adrenaline into your blood stream. Okay. Well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? When you're yelled, when people are yelled at, it triggers their. It gets you anxious. It 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 like mm -hmm. creates um, some kind of 
quick induced stress in that current moment, yeah. I'm assuming. It makes adults and kids have more difficulty thinking. They, feel, they might feel bad if someone is yelling at them. It makes them feel like they're feeling attacked or their sense of self is being attacked. They may be a feel more prone to feel depressed, anxious, or develop panic attacks. This is all scientifically proven. The effects of being yelled at can have a negative impact on kids or adults' mental health. That kid might withdraw from others, from you. They might isolate themselves. Some people express their feelings through anger. So if you get yelled at, well, then it makes you more tempted to maybe yell at somebody else which can lead them to being abu verbally abusive to others. We see this in what we've seen in movies about childhood bullies or kids. We now see, and we know, because we've been learning about childhood bullies, bullies for a while now, that if we see a kid on a movie and he's bullying other kids, what do we all think if we're watching that movie, Jordan? What do we all think about that kid? That he's probably got a, a rough home life. Mm -hmm. A rough home life. He probably gets yelled at a lot. Think of it this way. You know, as parents... We are looking into our kids' nature and their nurture. They are going to become who they are as adults because of their nature and their nurture. We cannot control their nature. It's how, it's how their DNA is put together, how they came out of their mother's womb, whether you gave birth to them or you adopted them. But we have so much control and impact on their nurture, right? Their nurturing environment. So if you want to raise your kid in a home of yelling and screaming and strong threats, well, then you know what to do. Should we continue or is this too dark? The hard part too, I'm just thinking as you talk is like, there are some of our lives and maybe people listening who are military, right? And they get yelled at a lot in the military or you're a first responder, you're a police officer, you are trained to yell, to get people to listen to you. It's that training that makes everything else, everyone else stop and listen to whoever is yeah. doing the yelling that yes. gives you the authority. So yes. therefore you have your life that has had this in it for so long. And then you come home and I'm not supposed to do that in my family. That's, mm -hmm. that's counterintuitive. That's hard. It's tough. Or how about this? How about you're raised by strong, aggressive parents or one of them yelled and you know, you coped with it and you, you got used to it and you like this parent. And so now you're like, I liked and respect my childhood. And so, yeah, he yelled at me. Now I'm railing at my kid. It worked for right. me and now it works for them. Like we're going, so now you've got a crisis on your hand because your culture is telling you that yelling is good, but the research is telling you otherwise. And maybe probably your spouse is telling you as well. Your spouse is probably sending you videos of mine being like, Hey, watch this yeah. video <laughs> yeah. this podcast. So this might be a good opportunity. If somebody sent you this podcast, then here's a little love note on from them. They <laughs> love you. They yes. care about you. They That's respect good. you and they want you to open your mind. Yeah. So please think about your yelling and, and, and think about reconsidering how you yell at your children or yell at the people in your life and to try new things. Put down the old tools of yelling and try some new things. So, Pretend yeah. you're in the library, bro. Just go and be quiet. <laughs> it's that easy. It's that it's easy. That easy. So, we'll give you some great tips in a second. Here's a few more minutes on this. So the science tells us that yelling can have far-reaching consequences on people, on children. There's a lot of evidence that yelling is detrimental to a children's social and emotional development. Sometimes people tell me on my videos, I'll, I'll make a lovely video about yelling and I will get hundreds of comments being like, uh, what are you talking about? Yelling works for me. My, my grandparents yelled, my parents yell, I yell, we all made great kids. So it makes you wonder like, how do you define a great kid? Right. How do you define success? How many divorces have these kids been through? How are they doing with substances, self-esteem, self gentleness? How are they handling conflict communication? What makes a successful adult? All I know is that the research on adults nowadays is pretty shady. Yeah. <laughs> you look at like how we're doing as adults, right? In a recently conducted study, researcher from the London School of Economics analyzed the effects of yelling on children, and they came with two interesting conclusions. Are you ready for this? Now, these two are not new. The research on yelling and on aggression is going back many decades. It might be new for you because you're just hearing about it on this podcast, but this is just the latest research that has concluded something we've known for a long time. Are you ready? Yeah. It's pretty bad. You, re you ready? <laughs> when parents use yelling and strict punishments, bad behavior increases rather than decreases. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm laughing. This is sad and giggly. What did you, how would you paraphrase what I just said? I mean, looking back, you can see 
that that could be the case, right? It's just like, um, like we just talked about, you know, a bully probably got bullied or a bully has, you know, a rough home life. So that of course, and you can see that now, but when you're in it, it's hard to see that because when I yell, I'm seeing the kids shape up real quick. They know if yes. I come home and I'm going to yell, they know they, they better act up. They Obedience. better change their behavior. Obedience. Right. Right. And Obedience. so you're getting yeah. that quick gratification versus seeing what the long-term impacts are. Yeah, people that yell, what they what that normally means is they value obedience, they value control, they value what they would feel like in their mind is respect. And the one word I say, if you were to put into into a word of what authoritarian parenting is really about and yelling, it's about compliance. Right. That quick listen to me, I'm in charge right now, follow, follow my, 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 my it's, rules. It's all, it's all rooted in uh, fear and negative thinking and lack of child psychology, knowledge, cultural patterns. And uh, this, like uh, this, it's like this uh, worship of compliance of the compliance idol and their fear that if I do not get my kid to comply um, and obey and to fit in these norms that I'm inventing in my own mind, well, then I'm afraid that I'm a bad parent and I'm raising a loser of a kid and I'm hurting society. So it's very right. much, um, it's not new. It's just like, does that kind of make sense? And yeah. But, and I think all these parents, you know, who, who feel like this need to, to, to ask themselves a simple question. Do they want their kids to act a certain way because they're told to, or do they want their kids to act a certain way because the kids want to? Oh, I think that's the big difference. So good. That's what we're going for. And then the argument to that would be, I don't care what they want. They need to. I don't care if they hate me. They'll thank me for it later. That's how they defend that. Right. I don't, but... I don't want to spend the time getting them to want to. No kid wants to. I didn't want to obey. I didn't want to go to school. This is their argument. And I just... did. I wanted to obey. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe I'm, I'm different, but I was like, I would try to, you know, every once in a while, you, you know, like what's the Sandlot saying? Go get dirty, you know, get in a little bit of trouble. Like I would do that on a small scale, but I would always want to be a good influence and a good reflection on, off my family. So yeah. I don't know where that came from. Was it because I was the oldest child? I don't know, but I feel like there are kids out there that would want to well, behave that way. We're going with this. This is where all the research tells us about authoritative parenting, which is good versus authoritarian, which is negative emotion, coaching, parenting, which is in positive parenting, which we teach here, because when you reach the kids' hearts, and you do these things like do's and don'ts and a don't would be yelling on a regular basis. Well, then what the psychological impacts of child psychology is your kid is more interested in, in cooperation with you or in compliance or in obedience. But the key would be cooperation versus blind compliance. So let's go to number two. The number two stat is the impact of yelling. This one, take this. And if you're listening to this, you might cry. You might start tearing up. And you might laugh. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm going to do both. Ready for number two? The impact. I'm sorry. It's just so funny reading it. You're laughing. Sorry. The impact of yelling and strict punishments is equivalent to that of doing nothing. In other words, yelling is equivalent to ignoring bad behavior. What do you, how would you pair? How do they that? get the, how do they come to these outcomes when they do these studies? I wonder. This is fascinating to me. To find these conclusions, well, they, especially they surveyed, kids. they surveyed parents, they observe it. They're like, when you, you know, does your kill, does your kid, does your dad yell at you? Does your mom yell at you? How do you feel? About but what's it? so funny does is you like, yell? you look at something that is, let's say a scientific study where you have to, you know, document everything and you, you, yep. you basically have everything laid out, peer reviewed, other, you know, doctors and, and people can look at it and, and of course uh, critique it. But then you have anecdotally parents, you, me, yep. society saying yelling, yelling does work. So what's funny is there's two different outcomes, right? You know what I mean? It's like, I'm doing the yeah. study every day. I, you know, yeah, my, my are doing me. the study. It works for them. Right. It works for you. Know, it seems like so, it's working. And then the study's like, you, well, it's actually not. Well, that's why you have to define in your mind. What is working mean? Right. What, what, what are you looking for? Mean? Right. Are you looking for compliance and your kids are afraid of you and that makes you feel good because they're afraid of me. So they'll comply. So therefore they're afraid of police officers. They're afraid of teachers. They're afraid of bosses and that's why they comply are you looking for something deeper which is this heartfelt connection with you where they respect you but they're not afraid of you because if they're afraid of you i mean go on and on so much of this on the podcast we've done in the past you know um are you parents or teachers 
in every home is a school. And what you'll find is that if you really want to teach your kids, then you don't want them to be afraid of you. Think about the teachers you had in middle school and high school. Were you afraid of them? Right. The best coaches you had, were you afraid of them? The best bosses, bosses you had, were you afraid of them? Or did you feel safe with them? And if you think about it too, there's billions of like people in the world, lots. You probably know the number. And your kid is going to be, quote, afraid of all those people. But there's only one or two parents that they have who they can feel safe with. So your kid doesn't need another police officer in their life. They don't need another principal in their life. They don't need another uh, coach cussing at them in their life. You are the only person in the world that is their teacher, their mentor, their safe person. And if you violate that, and if you screw that up by yelling or aggression or abuse, what have you done? And why right. would you do that to yourself? Why would you ruin this amazing gift you have called parenting and being close with somebody you brought into this home or into this world? Why would you do that? That's beautiful. That's a great, that's a great question. Ask yourself that. And I was just like, can challenge everybody to listen. Like if there's ever been a moment when they were growing up as a kid and they had someone they trusted or they had a teacher that they really loved that snapped at them and yelled at them in a moment. And it just removed so much of that comfort. It removed okay. so it much of that connection. broke connection. Broke you trust. felt awkward. You felt embarrassed. Mm -hmm. I've had that happen to me and you yeah. just feel like S-H-I-T. You know what I mean? Too. You feel Too just too. awful. How and so I think me? that's what you're getting at here. Yeah, Obviously, man. that's what you're getting at. Yeah, it was deep what we're talking about. It's like we're not, you know, like we're talking about some harsh things. And let's, here's, here's 30 more seconds, then we'll move on to some positive things. So here's more bad news. Research tells us that yelling at kids, this is very heavy, is as, is as harmful as hitting or spanking them for some kids. I have heard yeah, that. In fact, I looked at the Gottman Institute was talking about that too. Yeah. And even goes back to what happens is like number two, what we said, number two, like why is the impact of yelling equivalent of doing nothing? Because what I think you'll find, and some of you have experienced this is that in time, your kid is going to become an expert at zoning you out, shutting down, ignoring you. Your voice is or, just like a right. Charlie Brown parent and they, and they don't want to listen to you because they're so now emotionally disconnected, which then if you're foolish, then that leads you to yell more, right? which then leads oh, yeah. you them to shut down more. And then round and round you go, and now you've got major problems in the teen years, right? And I'm trying to help. Or these kids, that. they just pretend to be good while you're around, right? They can't be their true selves around you because, oh, dad or mom's here. We got to got to put on a, an act. So common, dude. So common. So, and then lastly, this should cut kind of last out and we'll move on to some positive things. Verywellhealth.com reports their scientific research that they found from all these geniuses, these psychologists are doing high level research on kids and parents being yelled at has significant impacts on both the body and the brain. The psychological impacts of being yelled at include stress, anxiety, and depression. So we've got to talk now about why we should stop yelling. So what do you think? What comes to mind after hearing all this doom and gloom and this scary right. stuff, you start off with something positive. Yes, it's okay to yell. Your kids don't need a perfect parent. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. You can yell in marriage and parenting. It happens. It's okay. But then yeah. we to talk this. Let's be honest. Drama. Right. These kids, they're they're tough, right? Tough. These little gremlins These out there just causing problems, they're getting into gremlins. stuff, right? Yeah, yell at them every once in a while. Whip them into shape. It's fine. Come on. You got to. No, <laughs> sometimes I tell parents, you, you do. So bad. You yell, Sean, I, or I yell, and I'm like, you know what? Good you know what? You. you let yourself <laughs> out there. You, right. It's okay to yell. Sometimes you got to okay. bring that passion, bring that life. You know, oh, but my parents yelled at me. I just don't want to yell. And I never yell. Right. That's why it's okay to yell. It's okay and to be I imperfect. Be, put yourself out there. Yeah. I mean, I've had to yell so many times when, when things are getting crazy in my house and I have to stop everything. In that moment, I just got to, hey, you know, as loud as you can. And everyone stops. And then let's say, you know, they're doing something. I'd be like, you know, separate right now. And then after that one initial yelling, you calm down, you take a little break. And then I go and I actually reinforce as to why I had to stop that process. So I get it. Like, don't think yeah. that yelling is just this terrible thing. It needs to be done every once in a while, but you want to do it as little as possible. And you want to really make sure you're getting the message across as to what you're yelling for. Yeah. Essentially parents are teachers and every home is a school. So if you want to, um, and you create the culture of your home. So if you want to create a, a culture of like a, a, your religion, well, then you know what to do. If you want to create a culture of, um, 
um, you know, ad- abusing screens, you know what to do. If you want to create a culture of alcoholism or sports addiction in your home, then you know what to do. And so he- think about this quote. Let me read this quote to you and let me get your thoughts. Ready? Because as they yell, they're going to have to cope with our yelling. They're going to have to figure out coping skills if they're around a lot of yelling. Ready? Here's what it says by Alan Sunners says this. Getting angry and yelling at kids for making mistakes doesn't, does, doesn't teach them to not make mistakes. It teaches them to hide their mistakes. That's exactly what I was thinking when I was saying that these exactly kids will put on a front. Right. So I was like, exactly these, these kids are just like, Oh, dad's home. Need to make sure I pretend like I'm acting, you know, like he wants me to or something. When the reality is like, these kids are going to go back to the way um, that they want to live while you're gone. So what, what ultimately we're trying to do is keep the gates open, keep the conversation open in your family so that they're actually living the way they want to live, which is also reflective as how you want them to live. And you know what? I'm going to give everybody here, Jordan and I are going to give you five action steps on how to stop yelling. And what we did here in the first part of this podcast, we hope you found it helpful. Just coming face to face and we hope it hits you in the heart in a good way so you feel more inspired to ever to put these five action steps into your home and to make them a part of your home culture. Because if you struggle with yelling, we love you. You're not alone. There is uh, nothing wrong with you. You can, um, you can do better and you can grow and we want to help you grow. Isn't that right, Jordan? Yeah. And I mean, there's so many people that come to mind when I wish I could just not only share the podcast with them, but just be like, man, just take these tips and try it. Okay. Yeah. Just try it because if everything you're doing is not working and I can think of a cup, several friends in, in my group that yell spank, if you do this, I'm going to give you a whip. And if you do this, I'm going to, you know, blah, blah, blah. The kids keep doing what they're doing. So let's just try something new. Let's just try it. See what happens. Try it. Try it. And yeah, here's another thing is before we get started too, you know, it, If you're ready to really um, put down the idol of compliance, if you're ready to try something new and say, you know what, I don't want compliance because I want more cooperation. I want more heartfelt, loving connection and cooperation. If that is where you're at, then this is for you. We're going to help you put down these old tools that are kind of crusty and rusty and uh, they're not good. And I'm going to give you some new tools. All right. So... I'm probably, I'm very, 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 very passionate about tool number one. I found it to be very deep. And when I Googled, like just for preparation for this episode, how to stop yelling, Jordan, I was pretty uh, disconnected and disappointed with the, the stupid stuff I found online. Oh, really? Yeah. Stupid stuff. Like it wasn't, breathe. it wasn't helpful at all. No, I mean, some was good, but it was like, yeah. just breathe, breathe. And, yeah. Take a and, deep breath. Uh, you know, realize that yelling's bad and just like, <laughs> Just stupid okay. stuff. You know what okay. I mean? Yeah, okay. Like It's like, let's get out of shovel and let's go deeper. You know what I mean? I want to get yeah. deep right now. I want to get a bulldozer out and out crane. I want to dig deep right now. I right. I want you to go deep. Ready? Action step number one. Might take. I might need your help in teaching this. I know you'll help me out, Jordan. Take a breath. And action step number one is I want you to discover, I want you to discover the root of your yelling. Okay, if you got to, if you got an apple tree. Because these kids don't listen. If you got an apple tree and you got bad apples, you want more healthy apples. Yeah. You can't just pick the bad apples and expect it to be a good tree. You got to go deep. Okay, get to the roots. So let me say something deep right now. Some people yell. Uh, actually, let me ask. If you were to ask the everyday Joe, everyday parent, why do you yell? What do you think the number one common responses would be? Like top three responses. Like, let me just put you on the spot. I would say because people don't listen. Okay. People don't listen. Okay. Okay. Um, Why do you, why do people yell at their kids or at their spouse? Misbehaving. So they yell because they are misbehaving, but why would, why would someone yell for misbehaving? To get them to stop misbehaving. Okay. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So they yell, yeah, because that's so, so true. That's so you're true. Trying to find some deep answer. I don't. I'm not there. No, that's exactly what I was looking for. I was like, what oh, about okay. misbehaving? Yeah. So okay. Well, I'm. I'm now. You lost. I lost my train of thought. What was I'm number sorry. one again? Um. Uh, what, what? 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 You're asking us. What, why what, do we yell? You and I totally because, agree with you. Because 
people don't listen. Okay, so one, people don't listen, so the person feels unheard. Okay. So you yell when you feel unheard because they don't listen. Number two, misbehaving, you yell. Especially for kids, right? Yeah, we yeah. want them to stop misbe- misbehaving. Okay, what else? Why else do people yell? I mean. Um, to, um, to take the attention, to have people focus on them. What, what would that, what's the word oh, I'm looking for? <laughs> you know what I mean? To like, to like, like a quiz or like look at me. Um, uh, yeah, I need you want, right now. What's yeah, that word? Want attention, control. Attention, like, control. Okay, yeah. Right, this is good, man. I'm, <laughs> this is, all right, I just keep going. I no, I mean. with you. Why else do people yell? They want attention. They want control. They want to be, they want what they want in that moment. Why else do people yell? To try to get a point across. Like mm. letting people know that this is important. Teach. I have to yell. Yeah, yeah they teach. Yell because they want to teach a lesson or a moral. This is good. Jordan's just winging this, by the way. This is incredible. <laughs> You're good at this. I'm just thinking. That's all hey, I got. Why else? That's all you got. You're so um, I, I bet you could come up with more. You're good at this. I'm all blank. If they're lost in the woods, they have to yell to find help. <laughs> no, that's that was poetic. But, dude, that's actually deep. It's they, different. They, they get so lost in They're the lost. emotion or in the powerlessness of family life, and they yell. It's like a cry for help. Yep. I was actually – I have my own you know, therapist, and that's something that I was talking about with my therapist re- recently. A lot of our reactions are actually a cry for help, whether it be stonewalling, yelling, avoidance, alcohol use, abuse, uh, resentment, um, defensiveness people pleasing they're actually cry for help that was so you didn't mean to like say something. i didn't mean that but you're yeah that makes sense but super no i was that, that is why people yell like if you're lost you have to help help yeah. you know you gotta yell That's right it's a different so type of yelling but it's still yelling but you're right you're lost you're yeah. you're you're you yes that was good you're so good so, at this yeah l- let me um no you're good at this let me um let me give you something that i've learned over working with families for almost 25 years now hear me out some people think that they have a yelling problem, but they actually don't. Let me, they actually have. You a, mean people think they yell too much, but they actually don't. Yeah. Like if you were, if you were to talk to them or if they're talking to like their therapist or their buddy or their friend, they'd be like, yeah, I yell at my kids. I know it's bad. I got to work on it. So they focus on the yelling. And so I'm trying to help you to discover the root cause of your yelling. Cause that's actually step number one. So please open your mind for a second and let me see if this helps. So they actually don't have a yelling problem. What they have is a boundary problem. Let me explain. Imagine you're a mom and you've got three kids, you know, under seven. I mean, that's hard. And they're in your stay at home mom. So they're always around you. Mommy, mommy, can I have another stag? He hit me, blah, 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 blah. And you're bombarded with all that negativity and the emotions and the whiteness. That sounds like a hard job. <laughs> Very hard. Much respect for everyone who has to go through that. Good job. If you are a stay-at-home mom or you are with one or married to one, I hope you are building this this mom or this stay-at-home parent up. I made it a new goal of mine. Every time someone says, I'm a stay-at-home, I'm like, good for you. I'm so honored. Like, I'm like honored to meet you because that is so hard. I don't know how they do it. So hard. So then this every day, we'll call her a mom in this situation, sometimes yells. And so she feels bad. She feels like a bad mom. And she's like, oh, I have a yelling problem. This totally makes sense, right? But what if it's not a yelling problem? Open your mind and just, I don't know you. I don't know who's listening to this. Just consider this. Maybe it's actually a boundary problem. Maybe you suck at setting boundaries. Maybe you're failing of setting appropriate physical and emotional boundaries between you and your kids. That's me. I'm guilty right now. I'll I'll just be honest. Yeah. you're letting all their emotions and their negativity just like, rub off on you and you're failing at being like, Hey kids, I, I can't right now. I'm going to time out or Hey guys, I can't handle this right now. Or, you know, you're using these tools that I, I taught a parent just yesterday in my VIP membership, you know, a tool of like, Hey, if you want to talk with me, then I want you to put your hand on my knee and just wait for me. And then when I'm ready t- talking or having my conversation or, you know, watching my, you know, thing on my phone or whatever, then you can trust me and I will come to you. You know, have you heard that hack before? Oh, I like that. No, yeah, I've never heard that. I like that. That's a good boundary hack for kids, you know, like seven and under. It's about if your kids, instead of just coming to you and like, mommy, mommy, interrupting you while you're having talks, like you, 
there's like 50 different ways to set boundaries with your kids, whether it be two or 22. And so what happens is this mother's yelling and then she's like, you yell too much. I yell too much. But what if it's not about yelling? It's actually about boundaries. Isn't that interesting? It's very interesting. It's making Let me, me rethink on. everything. Hang with yes, me. go. Hang go. with me. What if it's not a yelling problem? It's an anxiety problem that when somebody comes with you and they, they get emotional or they don't say things perfectly or they're angry at you, you get really anxious and you do not handle anxiety well. You need tools for anxiety, for feeling anxious and worrisome. You get in your own head. Or depression means you're dwelling too much on the past. And anxiety normally means you are, make, you are dwelling too much on the unknown future, maybe catastrophizing. So, we, so see where I'm going with this? We're yes. Just, yelling is just the, the outward like blood that exposes of the deeper inner issue or wound. Mm -hmm. Right. That's deep. Yeah. I, I, I can relate one? to both of those. Keep going. I got more. I got a few more. What if you yell because, you know, when your kids are going through a hard time, they do their thing and it makes you feel like a really crummy parent. I feel like a failure. I feel worthless. And really you don't have a yelling problem. You have a self-esteem problem. You have a self-worth problem. And you hate it because it's like your kids coming at you with their like regular kid stuff. It just hits on your self-worth and you don't want to deal with that. So what do you do? You yell to shut right. it down because you hate feeling worthless. This is interesting, huh? I'm going to pause you there for a second. So yeah, cause I got, I got a, I got two, I got a, I got three more to go through. Yeah. Great. Let me just ask you about the self-esteem for a second, because so far lack of boundaries, we can fix that. Anxiety, that's a, an issue that I need to, to do better myself. But a self-esteem problem, I guess that would be like anxiety, I guess, where I'm having to fix it on my own because because the lack of bound – I guess this is – okay, so I was going to ask a question that I'm just answering myself, and it was like how can the kids help me in this situation because the kids aren't going to know that I have an anxiety problem. The kids aren't going to know if no I have a self-esteem problem. If you're yelling, no one knows because no one's psychic. No one knowings why you're – no one knows why you're yelling. They just think they're angry and you're frustrated. Unless you actually slow down and you say to your kids and your spouses, you know what I realize what's going on, guys? Is, you know, I, I feel like, you know, kind of like boundaryless here. Like I, I need my alone time and I feel overwhelmed and scared and hurt when you come and you talk to me all the time and you, you over talk me or you, you, demand my attention. It's hard on me. I get, I get confused and I get scared. And so then I realizing this about myself, I yell. See, that's see man. How know. would we ever know this if we didn't take time to self-reflect, right? Like you asking me discover the root of yelling. I would never think that on my normal day-to-day -day basis. I would just continue to react and yell. So it's like, first off, thank you for bringing it to our attention to actually ask ourselves, why are we yelling? Because most people won't even ask themselves that. I wouldn't if it wasn't for this podcast. Why am I yelling? I would just yell. Yeah, I think most people, they don't really take the time to just pause and be like, what is going on inside of me? You know, right. deeper. Let's get out the shovel and let's go deep. Like that, I mean, that self-esteem one is obviously very deep, right? Yeah. Self-worth. And it's like very common though, is like people, it's like, it could happen in marriage too, or your, your spouse is angry, or maybe your spouse is sad. Maybe your spouse says something like, you know what, I'm, I'm just hurting right now, or I'm going through a hard time, or, you know, we're not doing well. And then instead of you responding with, you know, love and gentleness and positivity, care, stepping into them with comfort, you go the other direction. You go defensive. You get angry. You feel like it's attack on you. You feel like you're a bad person or you're oh, yeah. broken oh, or, yeah. you know, you're, you're not worth it or you right. can never make this person happy or I can never be enough. And that would be an example of how, like, you know, you might want to look into your self-esteem and self-worth if you're struggling, you know, with how you're managing and holding other people's feelings. I'll say that again. How do you hold other people's feelings says a lot about where you're at steep that is deep 
Okay, go. Wait, there's a couple more because I want to get through these. So why do okay. we yell? So these are great. Like, boundaries, about, anxiety, self-esteem. I hope we're not spending. I hope we're not going too fast or too slow. Screen problems. Okay, now our dude, problem, that's me all day. It's so screens, man. Everywhere. Yeah. So like, let's say that your kids, um, it kind of similar to boundaries. Let's say your kids are uh, have unhealthy relationship with screens, whether it be your kids, your tweens, your teenagers. And you're like a good, normal parent. And you're asking them to, you know, clean the cat box, clean the dog poop, do some chores, share some family time, giggle, laugh, go to the family vacations. And your kids are just dehumanizing you. They're ignoring you. They don't care about your feelings. They're just obsessed in their screen world and their selfish screen existence. That sounds painful, doesn't it? Yeah. I think uh, it was during COVID. There was some video that went viral of this uh, parent. He was mad at his kid. What happened? Something happened to his kid where he was, he, he took his Xbox or PS3 or some console. Do you remember this? And he took it out into the backyard and he like took a sledgehammer to it. The dad. The dad, the dad did. Do you remember that? So I it was like. That, I know. Yep. The dad. It's, and then oh, yeah. there's another one Just, where the dad took the green John Deere. Over, yeah. you remember that one? Right. I saw that one too. Over a pile of video games. That's right. Like That's one too. Loses his mind. Loses right? it. Yeah. Right. So like, and now on the surface, uh, we're like, oh, oh yeah. that dad has an anger problem. <laughs> that dad needs counseling. <laughs> right. That dad needs to go to anger management. But That's right. maybe not. Right? Maybe not. Maybe that maybe was a good not. answer. Like, this is like the thing is like, I say this a lot. I'm very passionate about what I'm about to say. Yellers get a bad rap. They, they, everyone's like, oh, you have a yelling problem. You have an anger management problem, but maybe they do, but maybe they don't. Maybe the people in their lives ha are really poor at listening or caring right. for them. Maybe they're, maybe they, they try to get through with good communication, but the kids and their co-parents and the spouse in their life, they're not hearing them. And they feel, these people feel alone. They feel scared. They feel overwhelmed. And they're like, I don't know what else to do here. So it's like. It's like not the person actually doesn't have a yelling problem. They have a family problem. Yeah, that makes sense. That right? makes I just sense. added it to the list, family problems. So we got screen problems. And now here's a big one. I know you're going to like this one. Um, maybe you don't have a yelling problem. You have a control problem. Let me hear you. Okay. <laughs> Two of my best buddies are firemen. You know, I like to pick on firemen because they're like this very organized type personality type, kind of OCD rigid, disciplined. It's like some of their quality traits, we're talking like first responders, military. It's like, it's like, kind yeah. of like it shows the best side of humanity or right. structured, right. disciplined, cool. Like, yeah. Cool, like powerful rescuer, right. On it. Successful type people, right. You know, the type, some of you are that type or you're listening to that, that type a, but then these people yell, because they like control. They want things their way. They don't want their kids putting their dirty soccer cleats. Right. They want things organized. Right. right. I yell at my kids about their shoes all the time. You're right. So they yell. And then everyone's like, oh, you have a yelling problem. You, you have to stop yelling at the kids. And I'm inviting you here to discover the root cause of your yelling. Because maybe you don't have a yelling problem. Maybe you have a control problem. Let me say something edgy. Maybe you weren't ready to get married in the first place <laughs> because marriage is about giving up control about sharing your life. It's about selfless love about realizing I want to share my life with this person and I don't want to control them. I don't want to control how we design the house. I don't want to control how they drive, how they dress. I want to be with someone and give up control. And I want to enter in this intimate, you know, selfless lifestyle. Right. Some of you maybe weren't ready to have kids because your mind was all jacked up. You thought you would bring in these kids in your house and you were going to like pull out a little bonsai tree and snip, <laughs> snip, snip them and make them. We're going to read every morning. night. It's going to be quiet bedtime at the same time every night. It's going to be perfect. Hey, I do want to give some words of encouragement though. If you got married and you weren't ready to get married, if you had kids, you weren't ready to have kids. That was me 100%. But I adapted and I changed and you can too. Right? So just continue to get better each and every day. And it will. It will get better. So me. Especially if you both work at it. I was never into control, but I, 
I was so not prepared to have kids or marriage. It wasn't controlled me. It was, um, yeah, I think for me it was, uh, it was just conflict, man. I just had no experience with conflict or good conflict communication. And, uh, I just didn't know. Well, yeah, because your 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 whole life is now with someone else, and you have to change everything. I don't even know. If you, it's kind of funny. It's like a joke, but it's actually sad and it's true. I only had one girlfriend before I got married to my wife Danielle. I only had one girlfriend. I just that's understandable. I dated, be I dated then. some girls, yeah, you know, I right? dated girls, but I only had one girlfriend. But here, here's where it gets funny and weird. You ready? You ready? Yeah. Do you know how what age this girlfriend was? Do you know how old she was? Well, how you mean how old you were or both of you? Well, let's see. You I got, got married, married in your, uh, your 20s. Okay, so, so 25, I don't know. I I'm married. just throwing up 18, 19. I don't know. No, this this girl was, I think she was 14 years old, maybe 15. I was a senior in high school, and she was a sophomore. Oh, and she was like a sophomore? And we dated for one year, and we had a very <laughs> healthy relationship. Not perfect, but I feel like it was very healthy. And so here's the funny part. I think it's funny. <laughs> Everything I knew about women when I got married was at 25 from, was from a 14-year-old girl, a sophomore in high school. Oh That's my all gosh. I knew, man. It's like, what was I thinking? What was she thinking? I wish we had slowed down and be like, yeah, I should probably learn more about girls. You, know, you didn't date any girl in college? I mean, dude, yeah, I went on dates like, yeah, a bunch but of no dates girlfriend. or things like this or that, you know, but it wasn't like uh, holding hands, boyfriend, right. girlfriend, how right. are you doing? Right. Like, I just wasn't into that. I was just like, uh, there's no girl that was special enough for me that captured my attention. I just wanted to hang out with my buddies and right. you know, read and go to school and play sports and surf and hang out with you. Yeah. And, uh, you were on a mission at that age. I know that. Yeah. I, I could see yeah. why you didn't really I mean, have was, time for any of that. I was always just motivated at growing and becoming more mature and uh, in my, you know, in my twenties and I was just very patient. I just feel like, you know, that God was going to bring the right girl in at the right time and I was going to know. And uh, that's kind of what happened. And her name is uh, right. about to celebrate 20 years of marriage. That's exciting. And of course, just like every other marriage, it takes work. There was a lot you didn't oh, know. So it was, uns work. there was so much uncertainty in the beginning and in learning and, over time, if both parties work at it, it can right. turn into something amazing. Right. But so anyone right. that's stubborn, if the other side doesn't work at it, it can't work. It can't be one-sided. Oh, it's got to be. You got to work at this together. It's so hard. And that so, brings yeah. me up to back to the conversation with kids. Sometimes it can feel very one-sided as a parent trying to do everything. But we also need some kind of cooperation from that party too, mm -hmm. from these kids. Yep. And I don't know if that comes with more maturity, but that's something that we don't get. And that's probably why yelling is so, cause they'll, they'll shape up right then and there. And I know that they're listening to me cause I'm yelling. I think if it's okay with you, I'd like to, um, I'd like to bring our episode to a close here and do a part two on this, because this is such a heavy topic. I really want to give people great tools on that. So, um, is it okay with you? We just go through just uh, a few more minutes of this and then we'll put a pause and we'll do episode two. Sure. Okay, man. Part two of this episode of how to stop yelling. So here's one more thing. Um, let me close up my thoughts on control. So if you are yelling a lot, here's what might be going on is that you are suffering in the human condition, which is called you are not in control. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shocking. Thank you and for that. <laughs> you, welcome to being a human. Welcome right. to being a parent or a co-parent or a spouse, and you are either thriving in this human condition or you are sucking at it, and you are acting like a baby, you're acting selfish, and you want control, and welcome to the club, you do not have it. So you may not have a yelling problem. The yelling is actually a manifestation of the deeper thing that's going on in your mind, which is you are not managing the lack of control well. Right. And now I can't wait for episode two because I want to learn how to fix this problem because a lot of us right now are like, yes, that's me. And I, I love this episode because I actually had to ask myself where the root of yelling comes from. And I think a lot of us have answers now. Now here's, I have one more thing. We'll wrap it up. Let's talk about the last thing, which is we're going to talk about attachment styles. Now, Jordan, before we did our pre-show, have you ever heard of attachment styles before? No. Okay, so attachment styles is 
something that these super, super smart psychologists have discovered. And now what we're going to talk about on this podcast, and if you haven't realized yet, that's kind of like what we do here. These super smart genius psychologists have discovered all this stuff over the last 30 years. And now I just, Jordan and I are just mouthpieces and how to do our best to try to talk in everyday language to everyday moms and dads um, about taking something complicated and make it super, super like simple and easily to consume. Okay. So there's, uh, so think of it this way. You may not have a yelling problem. You might have an attachment problem. Now we've talked before on this podcast about attachment psychology. A simple way of thinking about it is that when a child comes into this world, either through adoption or through birth, what your what the goal is for the first year or two of this child's life is that they would develop a really healthy attachment with one or two of the parents in their life. What does this mean? It means like, like if the baby is brand new, what the doctors do now is they put the, the babies on the, on the, usually it's the mother's uh, naked chest. Yeah, and skin to skin baby, contact. Skin to skin so the baby can feel warmth. They can feel close. They can feel trust. Oh my gosh, I'm not alone in this world. I have something. Right. And then the baby cries. And then, the, and then they instantly get food. Then the baby has a dirty diaper, feels uncomfortable, and boom, hug comfort like you cannot hold a baby enough you cannot be tender with a toddler enough like and this is very interesting gabor mate talks about this in a lot of his books and attachment and on on um you know toxic our toxic lifestyle or in about our culture or about trauma is like this is how the majority of human beings lived up until recently like when you're born in this world your mother is carrying you like in a sack right in the front right. You know, I think mm -hmm. we call those like what are they called now? That one Slings? brand. It's like a sling. sling? There's like, like a, one popular brand. It's like a. It's like you know. It's like on um, or whatever. Dojo, yes. Dojo, yes. I had one too. Yep. And so the the babies are constantly around the mothers, being held, being nurtured. Grandmothers, aunts, uncles, co sleeping, people sleeping together, cuddling all the time. Like they're with the mother, normally the mother, all the time. Is that does that sound right in history? It makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they develop these deep bonds and then the hunter gatherer of men, they come back with the food and the, 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 the resources. And then the children can trust the adults to take care of them physically, emotionally, and all that beautiful stuff. You with me? Mm -hmm. And then even if they're acting out, which you had to imagine our ancient ancestors were doing, it's got to be a communal event. It's not mm -hmm. like you have these five story houses and when little, little uh, child is acting out, it's like in seclusion, like everyone sees it. We're all right. these together. We're a village raising a village and raising kids together, giving people advice on parenting because we don't even parent. We parent in a vacuum right now. We're right. yelling at my kids. No one's seeing it unless I yep. yell really loud. And even if you can, he, my neighbors can hear me yelling at my kids. It's not like your neighbor's going to knock over, come over. Hey, Sean, how's it going, man? Right. Hey, couldn't help but hearing you. Um, your windows were open. You were yelling at your kid. Just want to say, I care about you, man. You're my neighbor. And how can I help? Right. Yeah, you'd get slapped in the face. <laughs> right? It's like, so you could show up at someone's doorstep and do that. I'm like, get the F out of my, you know, get off my exactly. doorstep. Uh, this I is my house. Me. I do what I do. Yeah. yeah you're judging me. Who the hell are right. you, right? Right. So... Yeah. Do we need to, we that? almost need to go back to that. Like we need to kind of, I guess that's why too, like when you have a good group of um, other families, you know, with like, like churches, they do small groups a lot. You know, it's kind of like going back to that village mentality where you're kind of parenting together. You're learning from each other. Right. And you're getting support from someone else. I think that's, that's great. You, we talked a lot about that. I think just maybe last episode about this you know, putting other adults in our kids' lives and our lives. So let's go back some thoughts about attachment styles. So here's what the psychologists have helped us understand that all of us can identify with one of these four attachment styles. Are you ready for them? Mm -hmm. The first one is called secure attachment. Okay. That's the goal. That's what we want. We want to be securely attached to our spouses. We want our kids to be securely attached to us. Now, we're not going to go into super high-level psychological language on any of these. It's just like a little a little dipping our toe in the swimming pool. When you think about attachment, secure attachment, what do you think of, Jordan? I think of um, knowing that whoever it is is not going anywhere. Um, you can trust them. Something's wrong. You can call your mom and know that she'll be there to help you. Yeah. Um, you get caught in a weird situation. You can call your uncle who you trust. They'll be there in a New York minute. 
right? This is something that I feel that's secure. My spouse, I know they're not going to go anywhere. They're with me. They're not going to leave me. They're So with kids, it's like I can feel their love. That's secure. There's no like mm-hmm. – talk to the hand because the face don't give a you know what for my child maybe that'll come later but right now it's not so i feel very yeah. secure yeah yeah i think you've it's just to compliment you i think you've just been i think it says a lot about how you're raised by your mom velvet you have just been you know very like much of a man who's been very securely attached to his friends to himself and now to your wife and children and so um, that's just how I see you. Now, the next three are called avoidant, anxious, and disorganized. And I want you all to think of it this way is that you can take some online tests, you can read some books, but with most people think of it this way is that your goal is to heal yourself and to do work on yourself so that you, you show up as a secure attacher and try to develop secure attachments. Now it takes two to dance, right? It takes two, two people to develop a secure attachment. Correct. Most likely you have like a really best friend. You probably have a secure attachment to that friend. You feel safe with them. You feel heard. You feel seen. You feel like you can be imperfect. You can yell and you'll get through it. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. But as soon as like something might happen to break that feeling, let's say the friend doesn't invite you on a trip that's like you know like there's something like surface level but it would break that secure feeling you would second guess everything yeah, you maybe would so secure attachers when a what we'll use a gottman word when a, like a rupture occurs well then they they don't feel overly scared or panicky or anxious they don't go abuse alcohol or drugs when a rupture occurs because they're secure. It's like, I just like a child would be like, I know my mom is going to be there for me. Yes. I know my dad is going to be there for me. So That's good. Relationship vibe. It's like, whether it be in a marriage or a friendship, it's like, I can trust that, Hey, we're going through a hard time, but you know, we'll work it out. We can. Right. Trust. Yes. And they're done that. And that's actually how secure attachments are formed. They're formed in the fire of conflict and bad times. So it's like, can you work through these issues? And if you right. can, you develop more and more, it's like your bros, your sisters. That's like what you and I have, you know? Right. We've been through ups and downs. And the biggest thing that we've gone through and the biggest challenge we've probably gone through, in my opinion, is physical distance. Oh, yeah. Right. Being across the country, that's the hardest thing because not that's the first thing to go. Not talking, right. Not seeing each other, not being with each other through hard times, not making memories together. Like we're like long distance friends. Right. And, and that can be very difficult. special going on here where, you know, you've been there for me during some hard times. I've been there for you during hard times. It's like we've built that. So we're yeah. securely attached right now. And, and, and yeah, I 100% agree. And that it makes it tough, but that just makes it that much more special that we still have this because we're both trying to to keep the relationship now if i was trying and you weren't i wouldn't feel so secure <laughs> I, I would go into some of these other feelings and, and that secureness would be gone so when you think about avoiding anxious or disorganized think about yourself as in it's like all the temptation whether you have like like a little cartoon angel on one shoulder or a little cartoon devil on the other avoidance will sound differently for everybody and i don't i don't specialize in attachment tr- or trauma but it might sound like this. It might be like, you know what? There's like a little voice in your head that says, you know what? You know what? You got to deal with this on your own. No one's there for you. Like you got to, you got to don't, don't step into the conflict. Just avoid it. Just avoid it. Don't do it. It's too much. Nothing good's going to come out of it. Just avoid that conflict. It's like this. They're more tempted to avoid conflict or avoid hard conversations. That kind of makes sense. Yeah. And I'm trying to link this back to like, the kid conversation because like feeling secure with your spouse, you guys have been together, let's just say a couple, you know, a figment, you know, just a random couple been together for 20 years. They get into a fight. They know that fight's not going to end everything. They still feel secure. This is that rupture you were talking about. They can get through it. They know this yes. same thing with the kids, right? You, these are your children. They're 11 years old. Something bad happened. You can get into an argument. You can figure it out, but you know, that's not going to break the bond between you and your child. But let's just say as they get older, Something that was so secure yes. is now potentially not when they. So an avoidant would be like, you know what? Kids will be kids. What do you right. Do? Boy, Ignore what it. Do? Right. Let them Avoidance do what they want to do. Often don't yell every day. 
they're the type of person to avoid conflict. Yeah. Avoid, 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 and then boom, they explode. Right. Right. That makes sense. So they avoidance can still be yellers and verbally abusive, but they're just like sweeping eh. on the rug. Don't deal with it. Yeah. You see how it goes now. Anxious attachment style. This is very complicated stuff. I'm not smart, smart enough to really explain this to you. And we can go deeper if you'd like on a different episode, you can write me about it. It's like when conflict arrives, they get anxious. Oh my gosh. Do they like me? Do they care about me? How do they view me? Do they like me? Do they trust me? Do they think I'm a good person? Do they think I'm right? Ooh, I, I get there. Right? That's mine. I do get they, anxious. Do they, do they accept me? Do they even yes, see me that's as good. a valuable person? Do they trust me? Um, will they listen to me? How, what do I do? I'm nervous. I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And then you can yell by controlling the situation, which makes your anxiety go down. And so, or you can do a whole bunch of other things like abuse alcohol or people please or rescue because you hate feeling that gray, right? Does that make sense? So you, yes. you, you struggle. I think you're, I think you, and I think Danny would say the same, you're a secure attacher, but it sounds like then you're more tempted to struggle with anxious attachment patterns is what we yeah if it weren't secure i would feel very anxious right and i even can say that i would feel that way sometimes at the office at work yeah. you know with people i work with like do they how do they think of me you know just the unknown yep. i think that makes me right. very uncomfortable and as a as someone who has a, a really dark history this is me of avoidant and attachment I have what's called like attachment wounds. Um, then for me, an avoidant in the past would have been like, I don't really care if you like me or not. I don't give a crap. Right. Like, I don't need you. I'm done. Let's move on. And that would be right. That would be somebody might, that might be what sounds like somebody who has an avoidant trauma or avoidant attachment. Like I just, I don't even want to do the work. Let's, let's just move on. I don't want to deal with it. It's too much work. You know, kids will be right. Kids. Screw it. Let's just yeah, and I think the separation is you can't do that with the people who you have surrounding your life with, right? Who you love. Like I do that with people that like I meet for the first day, you know, or like you know, I'm on TV. If someone writes me and and and, and I'm like, okay, well, I have those same thoughts, but it's like I don't have any feelings for those people. I don't have. I have no. You know. So with you. Like if, if you were to, you know, say that or think that I, I would feel differently. So I think, yeah, you're saying those thoughts are not good when it comes to people who we love and want to be close with. And then the last one, as we wrap up part one of this episode, how to stop yelling. And I hope you enjoyed. We went deep today. We got our shovels out and we went deep and then we got our, our tractors out and we went even deeper. Just find out the root cause of what's really going on your yelling. The last one is called disorganized attachment. And um, like this one is a little bit more complicated. If you ask me, let me tell you some of the symptoms of that. When, when, when conflict arises, these people just feel very confused. Like I just, it's a big mess. I have no idea what to do. It could be a lot of hot. It could be cold. It could be unpredictable. It could be a lot of fear, a lot of strong words, a lot of hot it could be acting out or it could be cold. Like it's just all over the place. Is, does that sound familiar to you? Yeah. Disorganized chaos. That's chaos. definitely chaos. And that could be then lead them into one day kind of being like, you know, leave me alone. I want to be by myself. Could mm -hmm. be, date. could be like stonewalling for a day or two or more, or it could be like, I'm following you in the house. You have to talk with me. We have to do with this right now. What are you doing? What are you doing? You have to make a role. We need a role in this house. No more doing this. You can't be talking to me this way. Or like strong language, even like we need to divorce or we need to go boarding school or this kid hates mm -hmm. me or, you know what I mean? It's just so chaotic for them. And, and so, extra, yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask you with these attachment cycles, what is the goal for us as we leave this episode? Like, are we supposed to be working on this in ourselves or just bring awareness of how we feel? Oh, absolutely. This is the thing you've, this is uh, an episode to point you in the right direction, right? To what do you need to do to become a healthy parent? What do you need to do to stop yelling? Do you need to look deeper into boundaries? Do you need to look deeper into your self-worth and do some work around your anxiety, around the screens in your health? Do you need to do some work about realizing that this isn't a firehouse? You can't control everybody here. It's not all neat and organized. Or do you need to do some deeper work, you know, reading around how to become a more secure attacher, right? This is like 
this is the deep work that I'm inviting you to do to get to the underlying issues of what's happening with the yelling. I think we did a pretty good job, man, of taking this. Like this was hard episode. Right. I'm, I'm proud of us, man. This was like, me too. This is like out of our like pay grade right now, man. <laughs> and I can't wait to get into episode two where it's like, we start building on this foundation that we made. I'm thankful for you that I, I have this opportunity to just learn from you and to share these feelings and, meeting with you and doing this episode helps me to be a more loving man and more patient man and somebody who feels more secure in my relationships. And so what's your attitude of gratitude as we wrap up part one? I love that. Thank you, man. I, I'm thankful for all those listeners who are trying to help their loved ones by sharing this episode and other episodes mm -hmm. with, with those loved ones. And if you are one who someone said, hey, you should listen to this. Just know that we're all a work in progress, man. Like mm -hmm. no one is perfect. No one is sending this to you because they think they're better than you. We're all just trying to get better together. And yes. so obviously if you have questions or concerns, you can try and reach out to Sean. He gets a lot of messages, but maybe he'll read yours and we can kind of bring it up. But this is really good because figuring out why we're yelling is so important. Now that we have that idea, we're going to build on it in the next episode. And if you do want more professional help in stopping yelling, uh, please contact me. You can uh, book a one-on-one -on -one with me or join my membership. I would love to support you. Um, stay strong, be close, and teach wisdom.